Good evening everyone and uh, welcome to our service of evening prayer from St Michael's Chapel. It's nice to see you here and uh, we're continuing our theme about being happy um, which is the theme of today but we're coming at it from a, a slightly different angle this evening and looking at some different readings. But we begin with a hymn, Blessed are the pure in heart, which of course is from the theme of earlier this morning when we were thinking of Jesus with what are often called the Beatitudes. Blessed are you, happy are you, um, happy are the pure in heart and the poor. So let's sing, Blessed are the pure in heart. It's not in Song to Fellowship, it's in Hymns Old and New 63, or the words are on the sheet. The Lord is my light and my salvation. My God shall make my darkness to be bright. The light and peace of Jesus Christ be with you all. Blessed are you, Lord God, creator of day and night. To you be praise and glory for ever. As darkness falls, you renew your promise to reveal among us the light of your presence. By the light of Christ, your living word, dispel the darkness of our hearts, that we may walk as children of light and sing your praise throughout the world. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God for ever. Now let's sing, Light of Gladness, Lord of Glory. Light of Gladness, Lord of Glory, Jesus Christ, our King most holy, shine among us in your mercy. Earth and heaven join their hymn. Let us sing at sun's descending as we see the lights of evening father son and spirit praising with the holy seraphim son of god 
Which never shall grow dim. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. O Lord, I call to you, come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Set a watch before my mouth, O Lord, and guard the door of my lips. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let not my heart incline to any evil thing. Let me not be occupied in wickedness with evil doers. But my eyes are turned to you, Lord God. In you I take refuge. Do not leave me defenceless. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. That this evening may be holy, good and peaceful. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As our evening prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise, now and forever. Amen. As we draw near to the place of at one ment, let us confess our sins. We pray together. Give us tears to see the wonder of your presence. Give us tears to see the wasting of your people. Give us tears to see the wounding of your son. We are the race that helped to make the wood on which you were crucified, and still we misuse your creation. We are the race that helped to make the nails that pierced your body, yet still we use work for gain at others' expense. We are the race that did nothing to stop your betrayals, yet still we are ruled by comfort or cowardice. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, Chris, if you can unmute and uh, read to us from the Old Testament. Our Old Testament reading this evening is found on page 766. It is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 30. I'm reading verses 1 to 3 and 10 to 22. The Lord's promises to his people. The Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Write down in a book everything that I have told you, because the time is coming when I will restore my people, Israel and Judah, I will bring them back to the land that I gave their ancestors, and they will take possession of it again. I, the Lord, have spoken. My people, do not be afraid. People of Israel, do not be terrified. I will rescue you from that distant land, from the land where you are prisoners. You will come back home and live in peace. You will be secure and no one will make you afraid. I will come to you and save you. 
I will destroy all the nations where I have scattered you, but I will not destroy you. I will not let you go up. I will not let you go unpunished. But when I punish you, I will be fair. I, the Lord, have spoken. The Lord says to his people, your wounds are incurable. Your injuries cannot be healed. There is no one to take care of you. No remedy for your sores. No hope of healing for you. All your lovers have forgotten you. They no longer care about you. I have attacked you like an enemy. Your punishment has been harsh because your sins are many and your wickedness is great. Complain no more about your injuries. There is no cure for you. I punished you like this because your sins are many and your wickedness is great. But now all who devour you will be devoured and all your enemies will be taken away as prisoners. All who oppress you will be oppressed and all who plunder you will be plundered. I will make you well again. I will heal your wounds, though your enemies say, Zion is an outcast. No one cares about her. I, the Lord, have spoken. The Lord says, I will restore my people to their land and have mercy on every family. Jerusalem will be rebuilt and its palace restored. The people who live there will sing praise. They will shout for joy. By my blessing, they will increase in numbers. My blessing will bring them honour. I will restore the nation's ancient power and establish it firmly again. I will punish all who oppress them. Their ruler will come from their own nation. Their prince come from their own people. He will approach me when I invite him. For who would dare come uninvited? They will be my people and I will be their God. I, the Lord, have spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be Thank to you. God. Yeah, let's sing, be still and know that I am God. I think you'll find it's... Um, Songs of Fellowship number 41, if you want to use that, or Hymns Old and New 52. If you can read us 
the story from the Acts of the Apostles, please. A New Testament reading is on page 154 of our Good News Bible. It is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. The Seven Helpers. Some time later, as the number of disciples kept growing, there was a quarrel between the Greek-speaking Jews and the native Jews. The Greek-speaking Jews claimed that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of funds. So the 12 apostles called the whole group of believers together and said, it is not right for us to neglect preaching of God's word in order to handle finances. So then, brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will put them in charge of this matter. We ourselves then will give our full time to prayer and to the work of preaching. The whole group were pleased with the apostles' proposal, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a Gentile from Antioch who had earlier been converted to Jaism. The group presented them to the apostles who prayed and placed their hands on them. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. The arrest of Stephen. Stephen, a man richly blessed by God and full of power, performed great miracles and wonders among the people. But he was opposed by some men who were members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, which included Jews from Cyrene and Alexandria. They and other Jews from the provinces of Cilicia and Asia started arguing with Stephen. But the Spirit gave Stephen such wisdom that when he spoke, they could not refute him. So they bribed some men to say, We heard him speaking against Moses and against God. In this way, they stirred up the people, the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and took him before the council. Then they brought him some men to tell lies about him. This man, they said, is always talking against our sacred temple and the law of Moses. We heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will tear down the temple and change all the customs which have come down to us from Moses. All those sitting in the council fixed their eyes on Stephen and saw that his face looked like the face of an angel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now perhaps we can say the Magnificat together. You'll find the words on the altar of service, this wonderful song of Mary. We proclaim the words of the Lord together. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour. He has looked with favour on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm and has scattered the proud in their conceit, casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things 
and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel to remember his promise of mercy, the promise made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Jesus taught us to call God our Father, and so in faith and trust we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, who alone can bring order to the unruly wills and passions of sinful humanity, give your people grace so to love what you command and to desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And if you have the order of service, perhaps we could say the evening collect together. Lighten our darkness, Lord, we pray, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night for the love of your only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. we come before the Lord to pray for his church to pray for the world to pray for our community and our own well-being we continue to pray that this evening may be holy good and peaceful and that your holy angels may lead us in the paths of peace and goodwill that we may be pardoned and forgiven for our sins and offences. That there may be peace in your church. And this week we're asked specifically to pray for the church in Japan, the church in South India, Congo, Kenya and Nigeria. And in our own Diocese of Chelmsford, the Deanery of Harlow, where the new bishop, the Right Reverend Lynn Cullings, will have Episcopal oversight. We also pray for the Right Reverend Goody Francis de Huami, the Bishop of Chelmsford. Lord hears, Lord graciously hears. We pray that there may be peace for the whole world. Lord, we bring before you the critical situation between Russia and Ukraine, and we pray that even now there would be strong diplomatic efforts to stop any potential war. It seems not enough that 5.8 million people have died of COVID-19, that we need a war to kill a few more. Lord, it's madness. It's total, total madness in our world today that we should resort to killing and conflict to solve issues. Similarly, we pray about the terrorism that is still rife across countries in the world. Lord, no religion should preach violence. No God should expect his followers to kill other people. We pray that you would turn the hearts of deluded terrorists to Christ, 
and that they would find peace. And we continue to pray about the coronavirus pandemic. Lord, we are appalled to see people fighting the police and causing trouble across other countries like Canada because people are personally and selfishly annoyed with the restrictions. Lord, help us all to realise that the restrictions are there for our good and for our benefit, to ease the transmission of the disease and to stop people catching it and to stop people dying. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for all those in our parish and all those who are sick. Let's pause and look at that list on our notice sheet. and commend all there to God's mercy and protection. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray that we may be bound together by your Holy Spirit in communion with all of your saints, entrusting one another and all of our life to Christ. We pray especially for the bereaved, those who are lonely and depressed, missing people they love. We pray especially for the family of Carol Gilbert, whose funeral is this week. Lord, we pray for hope, real hope, to be given to those who are struggling. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Now let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Now we're going to sing again um, a lovely creedal hymn written by Michael Sayward, um, the idea of putting the creed to music almost. These are the facts as we have received them. And these are the important things that we need to remember. And um, you'll know the tune, uh, an epiphany hymn, which is um, brightest and best of the sons of the morning. Christian believes this is the best 
basis of all our preaching. Christ died for sinners and rose from the tomb. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Servanthood. If you want to be happy, serve other people. If you want to be blessed, give to other people and serve the Lord and do what the Lord wants. If there was ever a golden age of the church, this was it. Um, Chris read that passage to us about the way that the church was growing and spreading in Jerusalem and in the Holy Land. And for the two or three chapters of the Acts of the Apostles before, we read about the Apostles selling their property and their land and pooling all the money and distributing it to the people that had needs. It was a fresh, vibrant faith. It's probably only two or three years since Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. So the events surrounding that are within living memory of most of the people who are being talked to. They probably had seen Jesus, and now the message was beginning to sink in. Not like today, when people are tired and jaded and miserable, and they say, oh, I've heard this story again and again and again. It doesn't mean anything to me. If Jesus is coming back, surely he would have come by now. The world is such a mess, it's horrible. Well, nothing has changed. The world was a mess and horrible when Jesus came. But Jesus changed it, and that vibrant faith was found by so many people. And many people are becoming believers in Jerusalem, even priests, we're told, from the temple. Hardened Jews who were first convinced that Jesus was not the Messiah, he was an imposter, but now they are turning to the Lord. And of course the apostles don't want to stop their job of preaching and ministering God's word to all the people that need to hear it. They don't want to become administrators. Uh, I'm not putting myself on a par with an apostle, but as your uh, priest here at St Gabriel's and St Peter's, for the last two years, I have become the administrator. I have become the cleaner. I have become uh, the treasurer because we, by the restrictions, wanted to cut down on the number of people coming in and out of the church building and all the rest of it. And so I know how they feel. But the other issue that started with the uh, early church was a language problem. I mean, isn't that true today? Even now people moan about not understanding some people, particularly people from other lands. Well, the Greek-speaking Jews were opposed to the Hebrew-speaking Jews, the original. Of course, there were lots of Greek-speaking Jews, because Jews had been dispersed right across the world by various exiles um, in their history. And one of the reasons they spoke Greek was, of course, Alexander the Great had been round the world, conquering the world, and giving his language to all the places that he conquered. But now there's a conflict between the two. So the apostles don't argue about it, they don't whinge about it, they simply get the people the church themselves to appoint seven helpers for this work of service. And in the original, the work of service is the diaconate from which we get deacons. So these seven helpers, these seven servers are the very first deacons in the church of God. And all seven had Greek names, which is highly significant because they were appointed to serve particularly um, the Greeks, the Greek-speaking people in the church. And uh, their job, particularly the particular job of a deacon, was actually to serve at table. So of course they were given the job of distributing funds and food to the Greek-speaking uh, widows to make sure that everyone was getting enough. But we've maintained that tradition 
And the first year of ordination for me and for all uh, everybody else like me is to be a deacon for a year before you become a priest. And the deacon's job is to serve at table, which is why it should be the deacon who prepares the holy table for communion before um, uh, everything starts. But as you know now, I mean, back in the day, churches had, uh, the vicar had lots of curates. So he would have lots of curates who were a deacon for a year and then another one would come along a deacon for a year. He'd always have a deacon. But now they're few and far between. I mean, the last curate we had was back in 2016. That's a long, long time ago. So that's why lay people have really assumed that role of deacons and why many of them lay up the table and help to serve at Holy Communion. But these first seven deacons weren't just content with doing the job of serving at table. Like all Christians, they wanted to proclaim the word of God. And Stephen and Philip, we know, were two very, very good preachers. Stephen performed miracles and he was empowered by the Holy Spirit and had convincing proofs that Jesus was the Messiah, which led to lots of jealousy. Uh, many of the Jews, Orthodox Jews, opposed him. And because they couldn't refute what he said, they got people in to tell lies about him. Just like with Jesus, when they brought liars into his trial to say different things to get him condemned. They wanted to get rid of Stephen because he was leading too many people away from them to Christ. And of course, that jealousy and that attack on Stephen eventually led to Stephen losing his life and he became the first martyr of the Christian faith. Philip um, also went on to be a great evangelist. Um, he lived a heck of a lot longer than Stephen did, lived right into old age. But you know the story of Philip when he met the Ethiopian official in his chariot and spoke to him and baptised him. So the gospel then got to Ethiopia. The message gets spoken to people and they take it and it makes us happy. We're happy because more people are becoming Christians. More people are coming into the kingdom of God. We are happiest, I believe, when we are doing God's work and when we are obeying his call. Not when we're arguing about silly things that don't matter. Not when we're being selfish and putting what we want first. But when we say, Lord, here I am. Send me. Give me the work you want me to do. There is nothing more satisfying than doing God's work and doing from the tiniest thing to standing on a platform in front of millions of people. It doesn't matter how big or small it is, it's so satisfying to obey God's call and to work for him. Jesus died so that we could be forgiven and he rose from the dead so that we could live. That in itself should be enough for us to want to give back to our Lord. So be happy and enjoy your life of working for the Lord. Now, this is a, quite an old hymn. The strife is o'er, the battle is won. It's a lovely Easter hymn. And um, whatever the devil does to us, Jesus has defeated him. Whatever pain comes to us in the world, Jesus has the victory. And we must be conscious of the fact that we may have to go through pain and persecution, but it only brings happiness and blessings because we are doing what the Lord wants. Do you remember in this morning's reading, Jesus said, be happy and glad when you are persecuted because of me. If we can really believe that, then this hymn will mean a lot to us.
up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rains fall gently upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you all.